What are you auditioning for? Um, Charlotte Oregon, Studio uh, 301 Studio. Oh, interesting. Student run. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, I think a musical by Pete Starkin. Cool. Good luck. Thank you. I forget the thing. Blow it. Literally started solving happy tears when I figured out that I could sing what I needed to sing. And I was like, yeah, I'm using the track that might make it sound worse. Oh, I forgot. The only one I could find is pitched down for some reason. And I was like, this isn't going to work. So I'm sitting there staring at the other support. It's like, you can say, I'm not going to do it. Oh. Tell I ran the woman's time. I forgot to bring the attendance QR code. So you also fill it out on by going to campus or having, having already bookmarked it. The end is near. Yeah. Was it a good class? Yes. Good. It's nice. It's always good to have like classes you actually enjoy. Not that we don't enjoy Co 16B and regular 16B. They're very impressive. I just want to smash my brain in sometimes when I'm sitting there. Yeah, yeah. I I get it. How many statistics are calculus? I mean, because you need to know the math to use statistics. We're not really doing statistics. We're doing probability, which is which is a which which it comes up in statistics, but. I would argue that statistics is more about the interpretation of the data, not about actually just calculating things with the data. So we're doing, we're looking at the calculation side of statistics. We got we got time. Let's see here. You don't take stats. I do. I just want to push it off for as long as possible. Sure. Which stats class do you have to take? Three. Okay, that's not bad. You know all the math you already need to know for it. It's just out, it's a lot of algebra and a lot of again interpreting data and like answering questions about like what things mean as opposed to just tons and tons of word problems. It is a it's a very much lots of word problems. It's a lot of reading word problems and then figuring out what they're actually asking you to do and then finding the actual important information in there and using it. Yeah, you are right. Sure. I feel like I feel like that's not that's not something that is at least in my opinion particularly prevalent in stats 13. Like usually most of the word questions, the stuff that's in there is usually all or mostly all important or pertinent. Um let's see. Sure. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. 
Where is this? Tiny little one. Okay. Where our lecture is with right? Yes. Unless otherwise noted. Yes. Yeah. You're right. We another. Yep. On what? The Wednesday? Monday. Monday. Okay. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Because, yeah. Because the other class time has, there's on like Wednesday from one to three, I think. Oh, it's time. It's too time. It's too eleven. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I mean, I forgot the QR code, so please go fill out the attendance form on campus when you have a moment. Um, so just a reminder, as far as all this continuous probability density function stuff, I guess I, I could point out for a continuous probability density function f of x on some interval from a to b, the integral over that whole entire interval should equal one. And you calculate the expected value by doing the integral of x times your function over the entire interval. And you do the variance by doing the integral over the entire interval of either you can do x squared times your function, and then after that, subtract the mean squared, or you can do the integral of x minus the mean quantity squared times your function. Typically, this is what anyone would recommend because it's easier to calculate usually. Um, yeah, some, I, I will point out, I saw someone ask me about this earlier, and I guess your teacher is, has noted that another way of thinking about this is, and it's not wrong, is that this is the expected value of X squared minus the expected value of X squared, which is interesting, but not particularly useful, probably. Um, so just a reminder, these are the ways you calculate things. Oh, I, oh, there's one other thing. And then for the median, which we call lowercase m, you can either do it by doing, by setting the integral from a to m of your function equal to one half and solving for m, or by setting the integral from m to b of your function equal to one half. That's how you solve for your median. Usually the first one's easier. I could imagine a, a situation where the second one's easier, but typically it's easier to do the integral from your lower or your left-hand endpoint to whatever your median is supposed to be. That's usually the easier way of doing it. Cool. Um, so I suppose I should ask, are there any questions from any of the problems from section 9.2 or 9.3? Because I'm happy to look at them, but I'm also happy to move on to the stuff from the last two sections, which we should talk about at some point. So I'll give you all a moment to think about that. 
there aren't any questions for section 9.2 or 9.3, I will move on. Try and give you all a moment to think about it. Be quiet for a second before you think about that. All right. So I guess we'll move on then. We can always circle back around if you decide this is something you really need to see. But let's go ahead and move on to ish, section 6.5. It's a terrible one. Section 6.5, which is numerical integration. AKA approximating the area. Approximating the area using either rectangles or trapezoids. Or I'm actually going to say the last the, or parabolas. That's what Sim, so have you talked about Simpsons method? Or have you talked about any of this in class yet? No. But you have homework due on it. Yes. Okay. So she didn't talk. She talk, who's had class today so far? Anyone? She said maybe maybe she's talking about in class today. Sure. So, but there is homework on them, right? Okay. So I imagine you all still like we can totally talk about something else, but I imagine you all want to do the homework that's due. She also told us that we don't have to do the homework. Okay. That we've done all the rest. Sure, sure. Right. But again, maybe you maybe you've already had three not great homework scores and you wouldn't like, but that's pot. I'm not right. So we should still talk about it because it is something that is somewhat worthwhile and has its purpose. So let's go ahead and talk about I've got do I have these sections mixed up here? No, yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. Actually, I'm yeah, I think I have my sections out of order. That's fine. I think we're actually talking about section 5.6 first, either way. So um, we're going to approximate things using rectangles, trapezoids, and sometimes even parabolas. Although the parabola one, you really don't actually use parabolas. You just use this formula to calculate things. So here's the idea. We're going to do some examples of things we actually could calculate just doing an integral. The point being that we're going to see how it's a good approximation for something that we not have And then we're gonna talk about how there are some functions you can't anti-differentiate. Some very kind of, the most famous example being something like the integral of e to the x squared, maybe e to the negative x squared. That's a function that can't be integrated. There is no anti-derivative of e to the negative x squared. So sometime we might ask to say, approximate that integral. And so what we're going to do is we're going to see how to approximate or estimate the area under the curve f of x equal to e to the negative x squared on the interval from 0 to 1. Answering questions like that is kind of the point of these two sections. So let's start with something a little bit easier, though. Let's approximate um, the integral from 1 to 5 of 1 over x dx using the midpoint rule with n equal to 4 rectangles. First of all, what does any of that even mean? So what we're going to do is we're going to draw the region. So my function is 1 over x. It looks vaguely like this. And we're trying to find the area under that from 1 to 4. And so I've drawn kind of extra big, but that's OK. So we're looking at this region here. And what we're going to do is we're going to break it up into n equal to 4 rectangles. So we're going to break this. Oh, sorry, one to five, not one to four. Apologies. Which is a much better number to work with, breaking up into four sections. So we're going to break this up into four equal sub intervals. And then we're going to find the area of each rectangle under the curve for each sub interval. So 
we're going to break this up into, let's see, five minus one divided by four is equal to one. So each of our sub intervals is going to have a length of one. So we, the first sub interval starts at one and ends at two. And then the next one goes from two to three, and then three to four, and then four to five. And then for each of these sub intervals, we're going to find a rectangle and find its area. Now the question is, well, it's not really a question. We've already kind of been told how to do it for this one. How do we find the area of the rectangle? It depends on how we've been told to do it. You might find the area of the rectangle using the left endpoint of each other interval, or the right endpoint of each other interval, or the midpoint of each other interval, or some other random point that's somewhere else. Those are kind of the three normal choices though, are the left endpoint, the right endpoint, or the midpoint. So here we're using the midpoint, meaning I'm gonna take this point right here, that first midpoint, and then find the height of the rectangle, which is the function value. And then there's the rectangle I wanna find the area of. Similarly, there's gonna be a midpoint here. I'm gonna use that midpoint, plug it into my function to then find the height of a rectangle that way. Same deal here. And same deal here. For this particular problem, those midpoints are not hard to find, right? That first midpoint is halfway between one and two, which you could either think of 1.5 or three halves. I usually prefer fractions. They're a little bit easier for me to deal with, I feel like. So the first midpoint is three halves. The second midpoint is five halves or 2.5. The third midpoint is seven halves or 3.5. And the fourth midpoint is nine halves. You can always think of the midpoints as the average of the two endpoints of each interval. The average of one and two is three halves. One plus two is three divided by two. The average of two and three is five halves. Two plus three is five divided by two and so on and so on. So that's one way you can always think of finding midpoints is just averaging the two endpoints for each other. interval. So then if I want to find the area of each rectangle, well, the area of my first rectangle, I call this A1, Base times height, the base is one. The height is not three halves, but F of three halves, because I'm plugging this point in to the function to find the height. So it's gonna be one times F of three halves. And the second area is gonna be the base times the height, which is F of five halves. And then the third rectangle is gonna have an area of one times F of seven halves. And then the fourth rectangle, has an area of one times F of nine halves. Or more generally, the total area is gonna equal each base times each height, add it together. So it's one times F of three halves, plus one times F of five halves, plus one times F of seven halves, plus one times F of nine halves. Which if we actually find it, F of three halves, well, my function is one over X. So if I'm plugging in three halves to one over X, one over three halves is gonna be two thirds. So we're gonna get two thirds. I'm not gonna write one times anymore because we are one times anything to solve. And then here we're gonna get two fifths and two sevenths and two ninths. And if we add all those together, we get approximately 1.5. And we can compare that to the actual value of this interval. Because we could totally integrate this thing using our regular methods, right? It seems kind of silly to approximate this using four rectangles with midpoints because we can actually calculate it. But the point again is to see that it's a good approximation or decent. Um, if I do this integral, this is equal to the antiderivative of one over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x from one to five. That's going to be the natural log of five minus the natural log of one. And the natural log of five is about 1.61, I think. I guess I didn't write it down. I guess I didn't use my phone. I think one point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There it is right there. Yeah. It's about 1.61. So, pretty good approximation, right? We're not off by that much. So, using the midpoint rule usually gives us a decent approximation of the area under the curve, depending on the curve, depending on how many rectangles we're using. But that's kind of the idea. So, Generally, come on. Ah. 
Okay, maybe, maybe I can write things, maybe not. So generally, we approximate the area under f of x on the interval from a to b using the midpoint rule with n sub intervals as well each sub interval has a width and i kind of like to draw a picture here so i'm thinking of going from like a to b here's my function each sub interval has a width of the total length divided by the number of sub intervals so my width which we often call delta x is b minus a over n. Take the whole length, divide it into n equals of intervals. And then I'm going to call that my first midpoint, that my second midpoint, and so on and so on, all the way up to my nth midpoint. All we're going to do to find the area is we're going to say, well, the area is going to be the first base times the first height plus the second base, which is the same, times the second height plus the third. All the bases are the same times the third height all the way to the very last one. Or written somewhat more compactly, we can write this as the sum from k equals 1 to n of b minus a over n times f of m sub k. Have you, this summation notation here, is that familiar or should I talk more about that? I'm happy to talk more about it. Yeah, definitely. So all this means, so let me, let me do a quick example to the side here. If someone said find the sum from k equals one to four of two times k squared plus seven k, all you would do is start by plugging in k equals one. It's kind of like a function, except it does a little bit more than a function because you plug in k equals one, you two times one squared plus seven times one. And then you, after you do that, you iterate up to the next integer. So then you plug in k equals two. And it's called a summation because we are adding all the things together. So we're going to add when k equals 2. 2 times 2 squared plus 7 times 2. And then we're going to add 2 times 3 squared plus 7 times 3. And then we're going to add 2 times 4 squared plus 7 times 4. And then we're going to stop because 4 was the upper index. That's the last thing we're going to do. So if I'm doing the summation from k equals 1 to 4 of 2k squared plus 7k, I'm going to plug in k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 3, k equals 4, and add them all together. So here, what this really means, it actually I mean, really, what it really means is all this. I plug in k equals 1, I get f of m sub 1 times b minus a over n. And then I add, and I plug in k equals 2, and I get f of m sub 2 times b minus a over n. Then I add, and I plug in k equals 3, and I get f of m sub 3 times b minus a over n all the way to the very last one, which is when I plug in k equals n, and I get f of m sub n times b minus a over n. So that's what we're doing with this. And it's really, most of the point of it is just to be able to write things without writing all of this out like this, because it's kind of terrible. So that's generally how we calculate or estimate the area using the midpoint rule. We're just taking each base, and adding and multiplying it by the different heights and then adding them all up together. People often write this more, even more compactly as the sum from k equals one to n of f of m sub k times delta x, where delta x is b minus over n, the change in x or the width of each sum of the Okay, that's not the only rule though. So there's like two other rules for estimating area under a curve. This is the midpoint rule. There's also the trapezoid rule. So 
So we can do the same thing using trapezoids, which I'm never good at drawing. So we just use rectangles. Let's look at the same region. I'm going to try and make it, let's see. Yeah, I want to make it extreme. Let's try and use trapezoids. So same region. Hopefully my trapezoids are not going to look too awful. So I'm still taking that same region under y equals one over x or f of x equals one over x, and then breaking it up into these four subintervals. So here, 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 here. Okay, but now instead of drawing rectangles using midpoints, I'm going to draw trapezoids. So what I'm going to do for each subinterval is I'm going to connect that point to that point. Ooh, did I bring my ruler? Where do I put my ruler? I don't think I have one here. It's a bummer. Ruler would have been really excellent to have right now. Oh, well. I'll do my best. So there's a trapezoid. And there's a trapezoid. And there's a trapezoid. And there's a trapezoid. Notably, unlike the previous example using midpoints, the trapezoid rule is definitely going to give us an overestimate here because we have a decreasing function. So every time we draw the point connecting one point to another, it's always going to be over the function. I'm not trying to say that the trapezoid rule always gives you an overestimate because it doesn't, but definitely if your function is decreasing like this, it's going to be an overestimate. Whereas the midpoint rule often is better at kind of splitting the difference, which is nice. Um, so to calculate the area using the trapezoid rule, well, for this first trapezoid, the area is going to be, does anyone know the formula for the area of a trapezoid? Right. No one remembers the area formula for the area of a trapezoid because it's not super important. But what it is, it's your base times the average of these two heights. Although typically when people write it out, like they usually think about drawing the trapezoid this way. And they usually think about it as the they usually call those the bases and this the height and the area is the quote unquote height times the average of the bases. But now our height and our base is kind of switched roles. So here the area, this first trapezoid is going to be the average of the heights times the base. Which here is specifically going to be one times the average of f of one and f of two. And for the next trapezoid, the area is going to be one times the average of f of two and f of three. And for the next trapezoid, base times the average of f of three and f of four. And for the next trapezoid, one times f of four plus f of five over two. Now, there is a nice way of kind of thinking of this very generally. If we add these all together. So if I add all the areas together, I've got, well, I can factor out, if I add all these together, I can certainly factor out a one half. So I've got one times one half times, okay, let's see what I've got left after I factor out the one half. I've got f of one. I've got f of two plus another f of two. I've got f of three plus another f of three. I've got f of four plus another f of four. And I've got f of five. Generally, what the trapezoid formula looks like is this. It generally looks like you take your base, which is delta x, or your b minus a over n, and you multiply it by one half, and then you multiply it by f of your first point, which I'm going to call x sub zero, plus two times f of your next point, plus two times f of your next point, plus all the way to two times f of your second to last point plus one times f of your last point. I always think of it as this one, two, 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 one pattern. That's a trapezoid pattern. It's one, two, 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 one, always. 
all the middle ones are twos because they show up twice, right? Here, 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 here. And the first one and the last one only show up once. So that's kind of the formula you might not ever have to memorize because it's not going to be on your final exam. <laughs> but that's the formula we typically use when we're thinking about the trapezoid formula. So here it would end up being one half times f of one, which is one, plus two times f of two, which is one half, plus two times f of three, which is one third, plus two times f of four, which is one fourth, plus two times plus one times f of five, which is one fifth. If we calculate this, it ends up being approximately 1.68, which is definitely an overestimate. The natural log of five is actually 1.61. Okay, so. Again, let's actually do something that might have a little more purpose or point to it. I know this is not the most exciting stuff, like it's kind of boring, but it is something that I feel like you should see. Again, if you have other questions, I'd also be happy to address those. But if you don't, this is what you get to hear. So let's approximate the integral from zero to one of e to the positive x squared. Um, again, using the midpoint rule with n equal to five. And we will certainly see here that although this is a valid way of approximating things, it's gonna feel kind of silly because although we are gonna approximate this using the method, we're still gonna to have to use a calculator to actually get a reasonable result. And if you're already using a calculator to approximate the thing, why not just use the calculator to approximate the integral in the first place? That's kind of my opinion, but yeah, whatever. So we're going to break this up into five equal subsections from zero to one. So I'm going to take my total length, divide it by five, and get one fifth. So those are my five equal subsections. So that's going to be one fifth, two fifths, three fifths, four fifths. But then I need the midpoints. So the midpoints are going to be the midpoint of zero one fifth is one tenth. The midpoint of one fifth and two fifths is the average of them. So if you add one fifth plus two fifths, you get three fifths, and then divide that by two, you get three tenths. Or you could take your one tenth and add one fifth to it to get three tenths. And then this one's going to be five tenths. This one's going to be seven tenths. This one's going to be nine tenths. So then the midpoints. So then here's what we're going to calculate. Using the midpoint rule, the area is going to be, well, it's your base times all your heights. So my base for each of these is how much? How much? There's my base. Each of my bases, right? I didn't actually draw the function because it's long. But right, each of my bases has a length of one fifth. And then we're just multiplying that base by all the heights added up together, which is going to be f of one tenth plus f of three tenths plus f of five tenths. I know that's one half plus f of seven tenths plus f of nine tenths. Okay, here's where things get kind of stupid. It's going to be one-fifth times, let's see, f of one-tenth, my function is e to the x squared, so f of one-tenth is e to the one-tenth squared, and f of three-tenths is e to the three-tenths squared, and f of five-tenths is e to the one-half squared, and f of seven-tenths is e to the seven-tenths squared, and f of nine-tenths is e to the nine-tenths squared. Great, it's super useful. I mean, it's not not useful. It's just, right, like, what do you do with that? That's my answer. That's my approximate area under this curve from zero to one. I don't know. Is that useful? Maybe, maybe not. Um, we could also approximate it using the trapezoid rule. So here's what's nice about the trapezoid rule and here's what's not nice about it. Usually the midpoint rule gives you a better approximation. The trapezoid rule is nice though because you don't have to find the midpoints. So the trapezoid rule, we get to use the endpoints. And we can say that the area for the trapezoid rule is going to be 
your base times one half. People often write this part here as delta x over two, your base divided by two, or your base times one half. And then we're multiplying by, instead of f of the midpoints, and that's midpoint one, midpoint two, point three, point four. We use the regular endpoint. So we're going to do one times f of zero plus two times all the inner ones, f of one fifth, two times f of two fifths, two times f of three fifths, two times f of four fifths, and then finally, one times f of five fifths and f of one. So that's going to end up being one tenth times. Let's see, f of zero is e to the zero. Okay, we know e to the zero is one. And then two times e to the one fifth. It's still kind of crazy, right? e to the four twenty fifths plus two e to the nine twenty fifths plus two e to the sixteen twenty fifths plus one e to the one. Maybe arguably easier to count. No, it's not easier to calculate. Maybe it's easier to write the formula for. It's kind of it though. Um, so yeah, where'd you go? All right, one second. Yeah, yeah, we got that. Okay, cool, cool. I think I've got some of the same pages here. Interesting. Yeah. So the other thing we can do with this is we can also talk about estimating something like, I don't really want to do that. Oh, well, we can talk about the error. Yeah, the error is terrible. The error formulas are like, how many of you plan on doing this last homework assignment? Yeah, it's like none of us. That's, that's all right. You don't have to do it. Um, I guess I should, so, do you want me to talk more about this? Because it's totally fine if you don't want me to. Like, raise your hand if you would like to talk more about this stuff, or tell, tell me in the chat if you would like to talk more about this stuff. And it's really okay if the answer is nobody. Looks we'll like the answer is nobody. That's all right. So, here's what I'll say then you've got these approximation things. It is somewhat sometimes useful to actually be able to approximate stuff. And honestly, it's probably one of the ways our calculators are actually estimating these. Like if you have a calculator that is able to find the area under a curve, it's probably using one of these methods and then but just taking a very, very large value for N so that we get a very, very fine approximation, right? Our, our Ns were very small because it's hard to do, but you could let N be a thousand or a million or a billion. Basically they're letting N be big enough so that the number of decimals they're able to display on the calculator is at a point where the next iteration of it wouldn't change that value. So it's it's correct to that number of decimal places. But yeah, as far as your life is in math is concerned, this is not the stuff that's most important. It's not not important. It's just not that important. Okay, so we got 20 minutes left. What should we talk about? We don't have to do anything. We could just not, we could just end class early and I can go over to drop in and help people out over there. Oh, yeah, we can do a problem. Yes. Someone, someone coming in from the chat to save me. Let's see. Sure, we can do a problem like the last problem on section 9.3. Let's take a look. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't do enough median problems anyway. That's a good example. So let's say we've got the function f of x. That's an f, believe it or not. Sure. F of x is equal to 5 over 4x squared. It models a continuous probability for x between 1 and 5. Find the median. OK. So again, you could calculate this in one of two ways. The way I would certainly calculate it is to do the integral from my lower limit to my as yet to be found median of my function equal to one half. That is how I should be solving this. All right, so I, 
again, just to be complete here, you could also have done it as the integral from your median to five of your function, also equal to one half. It's another way you can go about solving it. I can't ever see a reason why you would do it this, well, that's not true, I totally could. Um, if your interval was like from negative infinity to zero, you would definitely want to use the upper one because then you have to deal with infinity. Yeah, thank you. So the median, so here's what we've got. We've got this function five over four X squared. So if I plug in one, five over four is like five fourths. That's like right about there. And I plug in five, five over four times 25 is five over 100, which is one twentieth. So pretty small. And this function does something like this on this interval. And what we want to find is the place where half of the area is below the median and half of the area is below the median. Or I should say, I should actually reiterate that the median is defined as the number where half of the probability is below it and half of the probability is above it. So just as another example that you might be familiar with, if you've ever seen a bell curve or a standard normal, a standard normal distribution, the median is the middle because half of the area is below it and half of the area is above it. The median is also equal to the mean in that example. So sometimes the median and the mean or the expected value are equal to each other. Like in your, what's the one again? In your, oh my gosh, I never remember the name for it. Not the standard normal distribution, but the, the other one that's just a straight line. I can't remember the name for it. It's called a uniform distribution. A un, in a uniform distribution, the median and the mean are the same. They're both the average of the endpoints, which makes sense because that's the mean. So what we're looking for is we're looking for the number. It's probably, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eyeball it, probably right about there, where the area on each side is one half. So that's why we're setting it equal to one half, because we want the integral from one to m of our function to equal one half, or alternatively, the integral from m to five of our function to equal one half. Either way. Cool. So then it's usually mostly an exercise in doing some algebra. So I would probably bring out the five fourths and I probably rewrite this as the integral from one to M of X to the negative two. And then since I know I'm gonna have to solve for M, I might even multiply both sides. Uh, no, I probably wouldn't, I don't know. No, I'll just leave it. I'm gonna do five fourths. The integral of X to the negative two is X to the negative one divided by negative one from one to M and that's equal to one half. So then I would, I would definitely rewrite this. I do not want to write M to the negative one. I want something that's easier for me to deal with. So I'm going to rewrite this as five fourths times negative one over X from one to M equal to one half. So then I've got five fourths times, if I plug in M, I get negative one over M, I plug in I subtract and I plug in one, I get negative one over one. Do you be careful? I definitely saw someone earlier today missed one of these minus signs here and had a really hard time with the problem because of that. Still equal to one half. Okay, so now I'm trying to solve for M. So I would probably multiply both sides by four, four fifths. I'm going to get whatever's in the brackets here, which I'll deal with in a second, equal to one half times four fifths. And I would rewrite this as negative one over M plus one or one minus one over M. So now I have one minus one over M equal to eight tenths, which, or I could reduce that to four, sorry, eight tenths, four tenths, which is two fifths, oh my gosh. And so then we can say that one over M has to equal three fifths, right? We can go one minus, hold this one one minus two fifths equals one over M. So then three fifths equals one over M. So five thirds is equal to our median. Our median is five thirds. Certainly makes sense in my opinion that it's closer to one than it is to five because more, right? The function is higher up closer to one than it is to five. So we've got more of the area on the left than we go up, right? That's how we calculate it. Yeah, that's not a bad question. Um, let's see what time is it?
Yeah. I have just a question about this class. Okay. Uh, is Friday the last one? Or yeah, Friday is the last one. So there's no classes, whether they're co classes or regular classes during finals week, just finals. Um, certainly myself and the rest of the AATC staff, like Grant, Sarah, other AC, other people who are online. We will be available next week in the math drop-in area. We won't be anywhere else. So we won't be in C class. We won't be in CADS. We'll just be in math drop-in. Um, various times, Monday through Thursday slash Friday. Well, Monday is all that matters to you, all right? Or if some of you Wednesday, maybe. But we'll definitely be there Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I think our hours, let me actually check here if our, if our schedule is up on our website yet. If it's not yet, it should be soon. Take a look and see. What time you guys, wait, you guys said some Monday at eight, right? Ugh, I'm sorry. So you won't really be able to get any help from us next week because, um, yeah, is there dropping on Sunday? I don't know. Let's find out. Let's see. <laughs> Finals drop in schedule. It doesn't actually say when we are there, but so for those of you who have your mid, your final on Wednesday, um, we'll be available in drop, math drop in on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from pretty much nine to four. I won't be there the whole time, but I'll certainly be there a lot of the time. So like I think ten to noon and one to three or two to four on most of those days. So if your classes, if your finals on Wednesday, you can certainly find me there. If your finals on Monday, you can also find me there. But you'll already have taken your final, so. Um, yeah, as far as, yeah, whatever you guys want to go over, I guess we can do a review of sorts. Um, I have posted, I mean, since the beginning of the quarter, some old finals from this professor. So they are certainly on campus. I imagine she is probably giving you the same ones, but she might not be. So yeah, we can look at those. That's probably what, that's probably what I'll do is I'll probably pick something like that. I have other practice materials though. So Unless there's something specifically you want me to do, that's what my plan is to do, is to review. Um, I would, I'll probably focus on, I, don't know, I would probably focus on what I think is the most important thing, which is being able to tell how to integrate or anti-differentiate various types of integrals. Specifically, looking at something and trying to determine what method of integration we should use. That's probably what I would spend most of my time on Friday talking about. But if there are other things you would like me to talk about, like this probability stuff, or I don't really know what else there is other than that, really. Those are kind of the two things in my opinion. I mean, there's lots of different methods of integration, but they all kind of fall under the broad category of how do we integrate stuff. So that's probably where I will spend most of my time focusing. All right. Let's call it a day. Unless there's something else you really need me to say right now in the last eight minutes. Um, yeah, I'll be over and drop in. Yeah, I guess if I were a student and I had other classes, which you all do, I imagine, I probably would maybe bail on this last time because I'm too. Because it looks tedious and it's not going to be on your final and she drops the lowest three. I'm finding a really hard reason to come up with to actually do the last homework assignment. I, I would also say, additionally, I would say there's not a good reason to do it because that material doesn't really come up in 16 sequence. You're not typically asked to do any estimating or um, finding the error of your estimate. So I think you can, I'll double check now that the, just to make sure, um, but I think you're pretty safe to say you can probably forget about it. Also, if you come to the co-class and the whatever, not the co-class, but the workshop next order, which you can't sign up for in schedule builder, but you can sign up the Google Doc thing for starting tomorrow, I think. I'll I'll find it on Friday just to be sure. Um, if it comes up next quarter, we'll talk about it. So I can say, yeah, you're pretty safe to skip that last thing. I would probably still do it if I was a student because that's the kind of student I was, but you'd probably find just to skip it. You're welcome.
the guy. But definitely do 9.2, 9.3. Let's do the day. Let's do the double that one. You're welcome, Alondra. You're welcome, man. Yeah.